us once again. I pray everyone has been having a blessed week and everyone is looking forward to a very happy and Merry Christmas and a happy upcoming New Year. So I pray God's blessings upon all of us as we come to the end of another year. And I pray that everyone will be safe and by all means keep the Lord first and foremost in your life during this season. Amen. Okay. Thank you once again for joining with us today. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to get after our lesson. Would you bow your heads with us? Father, we thank you for the privilege to come into your presence. We come, dear Lord, to say thank you for every spiritual blessing you have blessed us with. We thank you for watching over us throughout this past evening. And we thank you, dear Lord, for bringing us to the pinnacle of another new year. So we just praise your name today and we thank you for keeping us safe throughout this past year, dear Lord. And we all ask your Father to let this be the most prosperous year that we've ever had. And let us bring us peace. And let us bring us good tidings and, and, and blessings, dear Lord, for the whole world. So just bless us in every way we stand in need. Bless the country of Israel. Bless Palestine. Bless the world, dear Lord. And just keep us safe, dear Lord, in every way. We know, Father, that you can do anything but fail. So we just thank you in advance for what you're going to do. This we pray in your holy name and for your sake. Amen. All right, church, let us get after it. Uh, now, last week, I shared with us uh, in our lesson last week that we was dealing with the 11 commandments of confrontation and if you recall I I gave us number one I gave us one of those uh, commandments and uh, where it says God declares that we are to share or rather we are to show respect and are to be treated with respect amen show proper respect to everyone that was the first commandment that we showed us last week of this 11 man commandments of confrontation. Now, we might not get through all the 11 of them today, but uh, I hope we will. Now, uh, I, I want to ap apologize because I told you last week, today we were going to start in a new lesson. And, uh, but uh, we, we're not quite done with this yet. And I thought I was going to finish up last week, but we weren't able to do that. So we're going to go ahead and, and uh, finish unpacking this particular lesson. Amen. <clears throat> And I reference last week, I referenced uh, scripture here to you for that in 1 Peter chapter 2, 17, where he says, Honor all people and love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Okay? So, so now today, we're going to be looking at this here second uh, commandment. Amen? Last week we dealt with the first one. And today we're going to deal with the second commandment of confrontation. God declares that we are to speak truthfully from our heart and that others are to speak truthfully to us. Amen? That's the second commandment of this confrontation. God declares that we are to speak truthfully from our heart and that others are to speak truthfully to us. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 25 says each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. Amen. In other words God don't want us to just blatantly lie to one another. Amen. We ought to speak truth to one another. Amen. You know, there's not much truth in the world. There. You know, many times people will look you right in your eyes and just flat out lie to you. Amen. Or, or try to shave the truth. See, see, if you take 
half of the truth away, then it's not the truth. If you take a, just a fraction of the truth away, it's not the truth. Amen? See, if you put just a, a, a little poison in the milk, then the whole glass is poison. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Now, 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 now Paul here, watch this carefully. Paul was not content to explain a principle and then just leave it. Okay? Where he, where, where, in this scripture I just read you here in 425, he said, Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. So, so he was not content to explain a principle and then just leave it. Okay? He always applied it to the different areas of life. Okay? That need to be, rather that need to feel its power. All right? Paul even dared to name sin. Look at this. Five different sins are named in this section. Five different sins are named in this section there in, this, in Ephesians. Are you listening to me? And Paul told us to avoid them, and he explained why. That's why I say he never just leave anything like it is. He explains to us why. Look what he says here in verse 25. He says, lying here in verse 25. He said, you see, a lie is a statement that is contrary to fact. Spoken with the intent to deceive. Amen. That's what a lie is. Okay, you can sweeten it up all you want to, but if it's not the truth, it's a lie. So he said, if I tell you it's noon out there, if I tell you it's noon, and then discover that my watch is wrong, I did tell a lie. Amen. But, but if I gave you the wrong time so you would be late to a meeting or, or, or so forth and, and I would benefit from it, that would be a lie. Are you listening to me? So, you know, John 8, 44 says Satan is a liar and he wants us to believe that God is a liar. That's what he wants us to believe. When you don't believe God's word or you question God's word, you're saying God is a liar. And, and that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Over in Genesis chapter 3 and 1, Yea, hath God said, Amen, hath God said. You see, whenever we speak truth, Guess what? The Spirit of God works. Whenever we speak truth, the Spirit of God works. But whenever we tell a lie, Satan goes to work. Are you with me? I mean, he goes to work. You just open the door for him to work. We like to believe that we help people by lying to them. That's why we should never lie to your children. Don't ever lie to anybody, but especially don't lie to your children. But such is not the case here. We may not see the sad consequences immediately of lying, but ultimately they will come. Because the Bible tells us there in that 1 John 2.21 where it says, Ye know that no lie is of the truth. So you, you, you can't make the, a lie out of the truth. It won't fit. Amen? It just won't fit. Revelation 21, uh, 22 and 15 says, Hell is prepared for whoever loveth and maketh a lie. The hell is already prepared for that. So he's just waiting on you. Amen? So don't ever willfully and intentionally tell somebody a lie. Amen. Now I know sometimes telling the truth is hard. Because we, we, don't, we always want to look like we're perfect and like we never do anything wrong and, and we don't got caught in something. We don't want 
make it look like we're bad people and so forth. And people will look at you like, oh, you know, you're a bad person. You lied, you know, and so forth. Amen. People lie more than what you believe. We lie, lie more than what you believe. Amen. People walk up to you and say, well, hey, how you doing today? You know, well, I'm just great. Amen. God is good. But knowing all the time, they're not great. They're not great. But they just tell you that because they want you to feel like, well, I'm, I'm, everything's just hunky-dory with me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Please listen carefully. The Bible says hell is prepared for whoever loveth to make a lie. Amen. Now this, not, this does not mean that anybody who ever told a lie will go to hell. So I, I don't want to, I want nobody to, to get the wrong idea here. That's not what I'm saying at all. Okay. But rather that those who live, who, rather whose lives are controlled by lies. Amen. They love lies and they make lies are lost forever. Not my words, it's the word of God. Amen. It lost forever. See, see the see the Christian's life is controlled by truth. Alright? Christian life is controlled by truth. And, and, and the first sin that was judged in the early church was the sin of lying. That was the very first sin in the church, the sin of lying. Over there in that Acts, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Just take your note and read it. The very first sin that was judged in the early church, please understand, was the sin of lying. All right? So we got that? All right. Let us unpack this number three. The third one is this. God declares that we are to listen to others and that others should listen to us. Wow. Hey Amen. It's hard for some people to listen. They like to talk. They like to do all the talking, but it's very hard for some people to just listen. You see, but that's what the Word of God says. Look what James says here in James 1 and 9. I'm going to read it from the NIV. Look, look what he says. He says, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Amen. But many times when you know people like that, they do it in the, in the reverse. Amen. They, they are quick to speak, but they don't want to listen. Amen. You see, you can't carry on a conversation if only one person is doing all the talking. That's not a conversation. Amen? That's a dissertation. Are you listening to what I'm saying? In other words, communication is more than just talking. It's more than just talking. You see, if two people are talking at the same time, they are communicating. Amen? They are just making noise. They're not communicating. You see, communication involves both parties. Amen. Taking turns, speaking, and listening. Amen. God, communi God, God communication, uh, rather, God, excuse me, good communication, wrote James, occurs when people are quicker to listen than they are to speak. It's like <clears throat> when I'm counseling with folks. Amen? When I'm counseling, I never interrupt. I listen. That's basically what I do mostly, is listen. Because if you listen closely enough, you will learn something that you didn't know. Because usually, what's being said is not really what's being said. But if you're not listening, you'll miss everything. Amen? There's nothing like a good listener. A good listener. 
You see, we want to speak and make our opinion known, please understand, but we must also be willing to listen to others. Because everybody got an opinion, everybody got something to say. So don't try to dominate the conversation. Be willing to listen too. It's called communication. Amen? We show respect for others when we listen intently and then speak carefully. Okay? That was, that was, that was a, one of the curriculums uh, in my studies was learning, being taught what it means and how to listen. Because if you don't listen, then you, you don't have nothing to, sh to share because you, you're not listening because you, nothing is, is, is penetrating. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So always be willing to listen. Listen to what the other person said. Don't be so anxious to get your point across. Amen. You have your turn. It's called respect as well. All right. Let us unpack this four for one. Number four. Number four. God declares that we are to express appropriate anger and to have anger appropriately expressed toward us. Amen? Again, let me show you what the Word of God says about this here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. Look what he says here. In your anger do not sin. Amen? In your anger, do not sin. Okay? Bible didn't say don't get angry. He says, be angry but sin not. Okay? Some people will get angry at the drop of a dime. Especially if things are not going their way. Amen? There have been many friendships dissolved because one or the other person was angry. There are many people that's in the grave today that shouldn't be in the grave because somebody couldn't control their anger. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The Bible doesn't say never get angry. It don't never say that because anger is a part of our makeup. Amen? You see? Everybody get angry. There's good anger and there's healthy anger. Or rather, there's healthy anger and there's bad anger. Excuse me. Amen? But it does, the Bible does say, however, be angry and do not sin. Okay, so there's a huge difference there. So you see, anger is a God-given powerful emotion that each and every one of us have. Amen? Handled well, anger can cause positive change. Okay? Anger handled poorly, however, can cause great harm, as I just expressed to you a moment ago. So, so what should we, when I, when I say we, I'm talking about us believers. All right? We believers, Christians, we are to be self-controlled. Control your anger. Control your your thoughts. Don't just say anything out your mouth. Okay? You see? So, so, so what should we do with our anger, our angry feelings? What should we do with them? Well, we should not indulge that anger, for one thing. Why? Because that could cause us to speak or act in ways that we would later regret. You know, and this is something you have to teach your children as well. You, you know, young people, they, they, like, they are so easy to fly off the handle. You, we have to teach them these things. Teach them, don't be so quick to get angry. Don't be so quick to want to handle stuff. As they say, handle my business. Don't, don't be so quick to do that. All right? Nor should anger be stuffed deep inside with us pretending we never feel angry. See? Should never stuff it. 
because if it's stuffed so long, eventually it's going to be like a volcano. It's going to build and build and build and build and build until you explode. Amen. As old saying goes, you can't unring the bell. Once you do something, it's done. You know, it's just like them, them little texts and things that we send out. Once you hit that little send button, you, you can't say, oop, and go grab it and bring it back. It's gone. Are you with me? Okay. I hope this is making sense to us. Let's look at number five. Number five here, God declares that we are to give and to receive only justifiable rebuke. All right? God declares, this is the word of God here. This is not something I'm just throwing at you. This is the word of God. God declares that we are to give and to receive only justifiable rebuke. Proverbs 15.31 says, He who listens to a life-given rebuke will be at home among the wise. Amen? He who listens to a life-given rebuke will be at home with the wise. So we always want to be wise. Amen? All right. Now, here we go with number six. Number six. God declares that we are to value and to protect your conscience. Wow. We are to value and protect your conscience. In other words, you don't want to run around when your conscience is, is, is filled with guilt and shame and fear and so forth. Amen. That's not, that's not of God. Please understand that. He's telling us to protect your conscience. How do you protect your conscience? Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. Here's what it says. Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Amen. I strive always to keep my conscience clear before man, before God and man. In other words, you see, we should always have the courage to impel truth. That's where the truth comes in at. See, when you tell the truth, you got a clear conscience. Okay? When you're doing the right thing, you got a clear conscience. When you're treating people right, you got a clear conscience. All right? Please listen carefully. Here, look what it says here in this 15th verse, right here in Acts chapter 15, 24 rather. Look at the 15th verse. Paul says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. In other words, you see, they were accusing Paul of sedition. All right? Which means to rebel against the authority of a state or a monarch. That's what perdition is. I mean, sedition, excuse me. And Paul said, he said, my conscience is clear. Amen. Paul said, no, you ain't, ain't going to get that off. He said, my conscience is clear. Isn't it wonderful when you can walk around with a clear conscience saying, I don't hold no unforgiveness against anybody. I have, and be truthful about it. Okay, we can say these things, but, but saying something and saying it truthfully is two different things. So, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to, to go to bed at night and lie down and, and say, I, I, I don't have anything against anybody. I don't owe nobody nothing. Amen? Are you listening to me? All right. Let us unpack number seven. 
Give me another, I got another few minutes. It says, number seven, do you or have you ever felt guilty when you had to say no to someone? Hmm? Do you or have you ever felt guilty when you had to say no to someone? I have. I have, a, I have on many occasions. And I'm pretty sure most of us have, if we're truthful. Well, look what the Word of God says. The Word of God declares that you are to say no without feeling guilty. Wow. You are to say no without feeling guilty. So don't go around feeling guilty because, see, sometimes we can, we, we, we can be so yes, 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 trying to please folks. And then we walk around feeling guilty thinking that, well, you know, I should have said no. I should have not, not agreed to that. Amen. This is what the Word of God says. You see? The Word of God declares that you are to say no without feeling guilty. Look what he says here in Titus. If you got your Bibles and still open, look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 12. Look what it says. It says, No to ungodliness and worldly passions. Say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Tell your children, tell your young, tell your young people, you don't have to feel guilty because your little buddies and so forth want you to do something that's not right. It's okay to say no. And if you say no to doing something that's not right or you know it's going to get you in trouble or so forth, just say no. Your conscience is clear. Just say no. You don't, don't care if they like it or not. It don't matter what they like. You want your conscience to be clear. Just say no. You see, in, in other words, grace is what reforms us. I said grace is what reforms us. You see, and salvation is not only a change in position. What I mean by that? It's not a change in position. It may be set free from slavery, of the slavery of sin. But it's also a change in attitude, appetite, ambition, and actions. Amen? So, so the same grace that redeems us also reforms our life and makes us godly. So godly living involves both the negative and the positive. Please listen carefully. Now, we deny ungodliness whatever is unlike God. That's what is, you want to know what ungodliness is. Whatever is not like God, or whatever is unlike God, that's what it is. And worldly lust, okay? That's what it is. Please listen. All right, I think I got time to give you a couple more here. All right, give me, give me let's do one more, and then, I'll, then we're going to close it off. Number eight. Number eight. God declares that you are to remove yourself from an abusive situation. God declares that you are to remove yourself from a abusive situation. Don't stay in an abusive situation. Don't stay in an abusive friendship. Don't stay in an abusive uh, relationship. Don't stay in an ab abusive marriage. Amen? All right, let's see what the Word of God says about that. Here in Proverbs chapter 22 and 24, look what he says. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man or woman. Do not associate with one easily angered. God, is, that's a warning. 
That's a warning. He's telling you straight out, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man or a hot-tempered person. Don't make friends with them. They'll turn on you like a snake. There are many friends who had hot-tempered, has, has murdered their other, their friends, their parents, because they couldn't get their way. Or things didn't go the way they wanted them to go. Back here not too long ago, a young man killed his grandma and burned her up in the house. Many of you probably seen that on the news. You see, hot tempered, can't get, I can't get my way. I, I, I'll take you out. He, the Bible tells, don't do not associate with one easily angered. Don't associate yourself with people who are easily angered. That's not going to be a good, uh, good relationship. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Okay. Because you see, God, number nine. Let's do number nine. God declares that you are to bring opposing parties to together to determine what is the real truth. Now, I think that's where I'm going to shut it off at because that's going to take me a little longer to explain that to you. Okay. But that's what we'll pick back up next week. We'll pick back up on number nine next week, all right? Now, I, I hope this is making sense to us. Now, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get through this lesson. We're going to get through this lesson, and uh, then I got another lesson for us. But first, we, I, I, wanna, I, I want you to get the full meaning and the full impact of what it means, what, I, what, what I'm uh, uh, trying to show us here about confrontation, challenging others to change. Amen. People will change, amen, if we challenge them in the right way. You will see a change, unless you're dealing with the devil. Okay? So, so next week, come back with me, and we're going to pick back up on this ninth commandment of confrontation. All right? Okay, God bless you. I hope this is making sense to us and I hope you will uh, take it and use it and use it to your glory, for the glory of God rather, because listen, you deal with this stuff every day. Every single day of your life in some fashion or another, you deal with every single thing that we just talked about here. It's not that you're not going to deal with it, it's how you're going to deal with it. See, there's an appropriate way to deal with everything. There's a proper way to deal with your anger, you see. There's a proper way to communicate with one another and so forth. And, and this is what this is designed to do here, is to help us to do that and do it in a godly way, in an intelligent way, in a loving way. Okay? God blesses this because these are his commandments. They're not mine. I didn't sit down somewhere and conjure up this stuff. This stuff comes straight out of the Bible. Are you listening to me? Okay. All right, well, we're going to break it off here, and you're going to come back next week, and we're going to unpack these other uh, three commandments. All right? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming to your presence today, and we thank you for what you have shared with us in your word. So we just pray that you would let it find a lodging place in our hearts, and let us use it and use it all for your glory because this, uh, this, is, your, this is your word, Father. And your word is truth. There is no other truth but your word because you tell us in your word, I am the truth. I am the way and the life. So bless us now, oh God, as we go into this Christmas season. It's all about you, Father. And let us keep our minds and our hearts focused on you. And let us go into another new year, dear Lord. Blessed beyond measure. And let us be a blessing to someone as well. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Christmas and a very, very prosperous New Year.
God loves you and I love you as well. Take care and we'll talk next week. God bless.